Okay, well, welcome to the next session uh, of GBIF. Um, this discussion is all about the future of the banking sector after COVID. Uh, we, have, we have a very good uh, set of panellists today. I, I'm just, before we get into the debate, I'll just let them briefly uh, introduce themselves. Um, perhaps we could start with you, Rosalie. Hi, good afternoon. My name's uh, Rosalie Pinkney. Um, I am a bank's credit analyst for Columbia Threadneedle. Um, My here. name is Samuel Lopez Briseño. I work for Vanguard. I'm a senior financial analyst in Europe. Thank you. Uh, Tiger and um, Atsushi. Yes, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Atsushi Ochiyama. I'm a head of the uh, strategy issues uh, of SNBC. We manage all the uh, issues out of SNBC. And my name is Tiger Naga from the SNBC. Uh, nice to meet you. Looking forward to the discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rob Collins. Uh, I look after nationwide building societies, uh, front office, both in an issuance and investment context. Nationwide is a large uh, mutual building society uh, in the UK that is primarily uh, residential mortgages and retail deposits. Alex, please. Yes, good afternoon. I'm uh, Alex Lehman. I'm with Think Tank Bruegel uh, in Brussels, uh, working on European banking and capital markets uh, regulation and policy. Um, Peter Green from uh, Lloyd's, Lloyd's Banking Group. I'm head of senior funding and covered bonds in Group Corporate Treasury. Okay, th thank you, everyone. Um, and just to, just to start off, and I, mean, I think we're at a very interesting juncture. Um, obviously, the initial outbreak of the pandemic had a, a profound impact on, on corporates and, and, and governments as well. But I think obviously there's this, this idea that at some point we'll see the, the, the impact filter through to bank balance sheets and, and now sort of just over a year on from the from the very onset of the, the pandemic, I'd just like to get uh, people's sense of where where we are um, in that in that respect, and whether we're starting to see some of the impacts uh, leak through to to, to banks. Um, perhaps we could uh, could start with you, Rosalie. Um, hi, thanks, Tyler. Um, so I guess um, in terms of uh, of where we are with with banks balance sheets, obviously um, the um, we've seen considerable um, coordination uh, between authorities, uh, governments, uh, and central banks to to support the banks. Um, and um, comparing it to, to the last financial crisis where cost of risk peaked at um, about 150 basis points for the largest 50 banks uh, globally that, that we cover, it took five years to recover down to about 45 basis points. Uh, this time round, uh, we've seen cost of risk peak at 90 and should fall back to about 45 basis points within two years. So I think, um, I mean, in, in terms of scope, we, we are, we're definitely in a better position. Solvency concerns um, have all but dissipated uh, thanks to all this, uh, all this support and stimulus um, and uh, capital ratios will, will maybe go down, but only very marginally. Um, yes, um, I mean, we do have uh, some of the asset quality issues ahead of us and non-performing loans will rise, but banks have had uh, about 15, well, 18 months by the time they start to um, have uh, MPLs increase um, to, to provide. And so this puts them um, in, a, in a better position to, to face these issues. Um, but um, clearly, I mean, there are issues uh, with, with profitability, but balance sheets by and large are, are pretty solid. Okay, that's, yeah, that's a, a, a positive impact, a positive picture. At, at this stage, Does, do people agree with that? Or, um, how do we feel about the uh, uh, how balance, how bank balance sheets are sort of shaping up at this, at this stage? Yeah, generally agree with the idea, but um, there are risks as well, of course. And I think one of the risks that we see arising is um, corporate leverage. We've seen corporate leverage going to new highs, and of course. Uh, corporates have uh, cash in their balance sheets as well. So it's not something that we are so concerned about, but it's a risk that uh, we should consider. Normally, in our base case scenario, that corporate leverage will 
progressively go down. But if that's not the case and there is some sort of um, deterioration there, that could be a risk for the for the banking system. And, and another risk there is um, M&A. Uh, as soon as things continue to normalize, M&A will come up as a significant trend in Europe, we believe. And together with that, there could be some disruption on banks uh, funding for, for the M&A themselves and, and balance sheets more generally. And, and the, the, the elephant in the room, of course, is the withdrawal of these support measures that we've seen until now. And how progressive that is, how managed, how well managed that is, is a big question mark. And, and banks will be, you know, uh, behaving according to how that is implemented. And that's another risk to mention, just to mention a few. Thanks. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good, an interesting point, obviously, uh, still under the blanket of those support measures. Is that so? Are banks well positioned, do you think, uh, at this stage? Um, uh, for, for the withdrawal of some of those measures? How, how do you think we're positioned? Um, perhaps Alex? Or... Yeah, could I just uh, sort of reiterate the, the risks in Europe are still uh, to the downside, I think, because uh, insolvency and, and sort of a usual credit discipline was suspended for the best part of the year. Uh, I think the fallout is yet to come. The ECB has, uh, you know, asked banks to step up capacity and 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 scrutiny and risk management. So um, they are clearly concerned that uh, not enough provisioning has has happened. Um, I would also reiterate the point on on leverage. Um, I think uh, in the, the highest uh, leverage segment, the vulnerabilities have, if anything, gotten much worse over the past two years already. And uh, the NPLs are as yet at an all-time low, so that um, shoe is yet to drop, I think. So um, the uh, withdrawal of the support measures uh, is has already happened. Um, the public guarantee schemes and the moratoria are all phased out, basically. Uh, the question is now, how will this transform into something more targeted and uh, you know, more supportive of a recovery? Mm. Right. And do, what, what do, what do, we've got issues on the panel here, but what do you think of your, your balance sheet? What do you think of the, the backdrop here? I think overall it's been, um, uh, you know, certainly 2021, you know, optimism is, is, you know, is, is a lot higher. You know, sort of clearly 2020 was, was, was a difficult year for, you know, for, for the you know, financial industry, for, you know, for, for, for banks, but I do think we've, we've, we, we're almost benefiting now, of, you know, some of the actions that were that, that were taken through 2020, and almost, you know, it's almost, you know, the official response and you know, sort of individual company response is almost, it, it sort of seemed to be a lot quicker than we've we've seen in, in in previous crises, and it's almost, you know, the lessons of the past have, you know, hopefully been been learned and have been applied to, you know, to the COVID crisis. Um, you know, so clearly, yes, there are uncertainties. There are, um, you, know, you know, we don't know what you know the end of you know, the end of end of lockdown, the end of support you know, measures means. But you know, from a balance sheet perspective, you know, I think you know certainly capital and liquidity levels are um, extremely healthy, very very high. Um, you know, through uh, through you know the, you know the actions that have been sort of taken by you know sort of regulators and 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 the banks. You know, we continue to see very sort of strong you know, deposit levels within within the UK you know UK banking system. We've still got availability of liquidity support from uh, you know liquidity support schemes from the Bank of England through through you know TFSME. So you know, I think there's there's you know there are risks, but I think there's lots of reasons to be you know to be positive and to be optimistic around around you know the outlook and. And how we how we emerge from from the you know the the, the COVID lockdown. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. And and Rob, would you have anything to add on that from also for, you know in the UK context? Yeah, I'd, but, but I'd pick up it. Yeah, and, and you know as I mentioned, we're we're largely a mortgage lender, so it doesn't get very exciting on our balance sheet in terms of 
assets that are perhaps a bit more uh, consumptive of capital. But um, I agree with everything that's been said before. I, I think there is a there is a point around um, everybody's paying at the moment, so that's good. And 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 frankly, you know, we've we've, we've obviously payment holidays in various forms in 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 the UK and 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 globally. Um, and again, most most of those that have come off payment holidays have resumed payments. Most of those that haven't were the, were the, were the cohort and relatively small cohort that were in arrears beforehand anyway. So I think there's definitely something around what happens there when we do see end of furlough for the consumer. How does that play through? Um, that said, we, we certainly don't feel that that we're under provisioned. In fact, far from it. We we, we, we talked a lot in in, in our um, year end results about a month ago. Um, about the significant kind of management judgment and overlay above what the models were telling you. So I think for us and, and, and probably for many of our UK peers in, in, in resi lending, it becomes a discussion around um, when's the appropriate time to actually start reversing some of those provisions and, and how does that play through. And then the other end of the business in, in terms of new origination, you know, let's, be, let's be very clear that we're, we're, we're continuing to see a very healthy housing market. We're continuing to see demand. We're continuing to see lots of new building going on. Um, and we saw, you know, it wasn't really very much of a closed window in terms of being able to offer mortgages. So everybody got back up and running pretty quickly. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen a, a gradual um, build to the last, what, I suppose, three or four months or so, where particularly with the announcement of the government scheme around supporting higher LTV at 95%. Um, pretty much most consumers who, who, who want a mortgage uh, you know, have got a bite of the cherry now. And I think that has helped um, margins which are significantly healthier than, than they were pre-pandemic right now. Um, and that said, I think we're going to continue to see, uh, because Peter said, when, when we're awash with liquidity, um, in, in, in its kind of different forms, but a lot of the ring fence banks in the UK have um, have access to to very cheap and sticky deposits. I think it's reasonable to anticipate that the mortgage market is going to get challenging again, or more challenging and more competitive. When that happens, quite, quite difficult to 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 predict. But I do think we'll see a return to thinner margins that we were seeing pre-pandemic in the mortgage space. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very. Much. And uh, at Sushi and, and Tiger, is that um, how, do, how, do you, how are you feeling about this? I mean, obviously, we've heard some of the risks described on the asset side, um, but you know, a general sense of positivity, I suppose. Is that is that tally with how you're feeling? Yeah, um, the same here. Uh, the, our uh, balance sheet uh, is uh, in a healthy condition, and the capital level is uh, high at the moment. Uh, but this is because the uncertainty, uncertainty, uh, the you know, fortunate or unfortunate, uh, that that kept us uh, from distributing our capital in the form of their inorganic growth or their, you know, uh, share buyback or dividend payouts. So, so uh, the, 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 this capital buffer means a lot to the banking industry at the moment. So I think uh, that going forward, uh, we can uh, you know, uh, we stand the test of this pandemic. That that's our view. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and just, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about um, you know payment holidays and and how that's uh, and how that how these uh, support measures are going to sort of be rolled off. And I think obviously there's a similar picture on the regulatory side and supervisory side with with um, with a, a kind of an attitude of support towards the banking sector that's been rolling on through the pandemic and. We're at this point where where maybe some um, some of that has to be loosened or has to be modified you know as we go through the recovery i just would be interested in in, in what panelists think of um of how we're going to manage that where are the sort of risks coming from on the regulatory side and and what's the outlook there looking like uh... yeah i can yes yes yeah so I think in 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 Europe the feeling is um, the the regulatory framework still needs to be completed, right? So the the Basel uh, agreement framework for uh, capital regulation, the last bit of that is yet to come. 
um, and that will constrain the banks uh, in the use of internal models. And um, I think uh, the debate is, is very much, uh, you know, the banks make the point they have demonstrated their resilience and uh, that this is inadequate and this would delay the um, recovery, whereas, you know, the regulators point to a very drawn out uh, phase in period and, uh, you know, studies that have shown that these internal models lead to widely different outcomes. So that's one thing. The other thing in Europe is uh, the the resolution scheme uh, and a sort of wider uh, requirement to raise MREL, so the Balin capital. And maybe a third point is uh, that, uh, you know, certain banks um, may benefit from, from exemptions uh, for being small enough to, uh, you know, not put the system as a whole at risk, so the so-called proportionality. And uh, I think the UK having left the EU will demonstrate a very different model and regulation and also supervision. So uh, that I think could, you know, bring, make this whole debate a bit more interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And well, just to stick with the UK then, um, Rob or Peter, what, um, how are you feeling about the regulatory outlook? Um, uh, what do you, what do you, what do you sort of think of the picture of of how things are going to be uh, managed? You know, obviously, as, as Alex says, we're still completing the some of the rules, and but obviously now, obviously, um, uh, recalibrating them for sort of the phase of the crisis that we've moved into. I think, I, I guess, you know, I don't disagree. There's you know, there's 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 longer term changes. I think if if we were to look more more sort of 2021, sort of clearly. Over the course of 2020, there was, you know, a fair amount of, you know, sort of forbearance on the regulatory front. But you know, we are starting to see that um, the regulatory agenda is certainly picking up for 2021. Um, you know, obviously got submission of recovery plans, resolution plans, stress testing back on the agenda. Uh, we've still got the small matter of eyeball transition to, uh, you know, to to, to work through. Um, so. You know, I don't think it. Yeah, I don't think the work's really sort of stopped. It's you know, there's, there, there was a, a, a bit of a bit of an easing off in in, in sort of 2020, but um, you know, it's we've, it sort of seems to be sort of you know, fully back uh, on on the agenda and obviously you know, sort of keeping us all keeping us all pretty busy. I and mean, I think longer term, you know, sort of clearly would expect you know, the regulatory sort of framework to, you know, to be more normalized as, as we do see the, you know, the economy recover and we, we, we come out of, of, of lockdown, um, you know, going back to the previous, the previous topic, you know, for, for now the banks are very well positioned for that given, you know, given the actions that have been taken on, on you know, capital and liquidity. So um, I, I don't think it would be a surprise that we do see that, you know the increase in or the the, the normalisation of the regulatory agenda, and that's that's certainly happening to, over the course of twenty twenty one. Okay. And Rob, would you agree with that? It's sort of an exceptional period, but banks are well well placed. Yeah, really. Yeah, I think I think this, I certainly don't get the sense of um, UK is going to be materially different to Europe in in, in the way that uh, Alexander mentioned. But um, it, it, yes, there've been little pocket forbearance has obviously been the, the Basel for pushback a year and everything but we tend to I suppose there's two points one is um, how, how are your how are your balance sheet metrics and shape and strength sort of pre-pandemic anyway so clearly in some instances you could you could almost say well that you know that bit of forbearance is, is healthy but actually it sort of just adds to a very big number anyway so we you know we're, we're kind of even better or even better place than we were before and then I think secondly, you know, the, our business ethos is to try and be ahead of the game. So, 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 so wherever there are signposts that things may not happen or they may they may be delayed, we tend to be quite upfront and kind of assume that worst case is going to be what the regulators say. So, so we've been quite open, for example, about the impact of um, Basel IV right through the the timetable and our CT1 ratios. Ditto closer to home. Um, we, 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 we've got the, the bank implementing a sort of consistent through the cycle slash hybrid um, mortgage models across UK mortgage lenders. 
which have to be in place by January 22. And again, we've been quite open about the impact of that. So I think it does feel as if um, it's kind of business as usual. It's it, it feels quite relentless. And as Pete says, you kind of, you're also into recovery and resolution that's gone from being a sort of side of desk to very front and centre and largely the main topic that the business is talking about alongside cranking the handles on stress testing again as well. Um, but it, but it, but it, you know, it doesn't feel um, uncomfortable and it, it doesn't feel as if we can't absorb any unwinding of forbearance because it, 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 it didn't really help that hugely in the first instance. I see. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And, and Tiger, that's usually, what, what, how, how would you, what, how do you approach this? What, what, what's, um, how are you feeling about some of these, these questions? And uh, let me speak about the uh, Japanese uh, situation. And uh, the, 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 what we saw uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the, the regulator amended the leverage ratio uh, relief. That is the same for the, uh, the US situation. And uh, the, this Japanese banking industry is uh, surrounded by the ample liquidity, the massive liquidity. And then the, what we face is increase of balance sheet because of the central bank policy and government support. So as long as this high reserve uh, condition continues, uh, the, we are pushing uh, the regulator to extend the, this leverage ratio relief uh, going forward. I think it, it, it will take time to go back to the normal. OK, yes. So it might be different from Europe, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so additional leverage ratio relief or an extension thereof. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, Rosalie and, and Samuel, did, did you have anything to add um, to, to these sorts of points? Or what, how are you feeling? From, about um, from a great investor perspective, uh, I have to say that the regulators have played uh, a very important role during the crisis. Mm -hmm. They have been part of the solution, and not just through um, capital measures and, and forbearance but also by the measures that they announced in terms of uh, capital distributions, for example, that were criticized in, in the beginning. I believe that uh, those all measures have been uh, successful. I guess from now on, going forward, what the regulators will focus on is to move from a support mode type of uh, approach to ensure that the framework, the regulatory framework is Good enough for the good enough for the future and the and the trends that are, are coming. I mentioned already M and A, and we could mention some new technologies as well that are definitely definitely part of the future trends, and also the perhaps some complexity, more complexity in the business models because banks have diversified revenues in the context of low interest rates and so on. So the regulators have to be ready to make sure that the framework is, is ready for those developments. Okay, yeah. And Rosalie, what, what, what? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, from my point of view, looking at all the sort of the regulatory help and the fiscal help, um, banks' uh, capital ratios, I think, have benefited to, in Europe to the tune of about 300 basis points, if you, you include the guaranteed lending facilities as well. Um, and this will at some point have to have to be unwound. I would expect regulators to move cautiously um, because um, they, they, they don't want to, to lose any of the um, any of the stability that, that they've gained through these measures. Uh, but equally, I think we're in a different position now than we were after the global financial crisis in, in the sense that um, in Europe, we have the deployment of the European um, Recovery Fund. Um, so that's that together with um, stabilization of of the of the health situation with increasing vaccine rates and the opening of economies um, I think that will will help to to counter any any of the concerns or some of the concerns that we have with um, with the with the reduction of of regulatory relief that will never will inevitably have to come absolutely okay and just moving on, I'd, I'd be really interested to to uh, get your thoughts on how this is impacting the financial markets. Obviously, you know, we've spoken about banks being well, but uh, quite 
did an awkward and in a strong position, but I see a lot of risks to the downside. I just would be interested to know what um, what the panelists think of of of, um, of how financial markets are dealing with this, because it seems like there's a lot of um, positive sentiment baked into into the market. Um, uh, would anyone like to sort of comment on 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 what sort of valuations we're seeing at the moment? I think from a from an issuer's perspective, um, I'm not too sure that we can we can complain about. You know, we can't complain too much about the levels that 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 you know we 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 can issue at. Um, you know, we do seem to be we do seem to be bumping along the bottom sort of slightly in terms of um, in terms of spreads for uh, you know for, for products across you know you know across the capital you know capital spectrum. Um, you know, I think. You know, sort of clearly risks and uncertainties around around the market, but you know, there's, there's sort of clearly very sort of strong technicals that are that are helping, um, you know, helping the spread environment. Um, you know, I do think you know credit markets have become very very good over the you know over the past few years at, at, you know, at adjusting to you know adjusting to you know to the macro and adjusting to you know to you know to headline headline risks and repricing very very quickly we saw that you know through 2020 uh, we didn't really have periods where the market was 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 shut but we, you know sort of clearly we did see a lot of uh, a lot of you know spread volatility you know across the year you know particularly at the end of end of q1 as 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 you know the, the you know the pandemic you know, impacts hit and you know, really before central bank measures were were, were, were put in place. Um, you know, I think clearly the risks and uncertainties are, are probably the sort of say it's the same conversation that we've been having for the past past few years. It's not it's not necessarily the you know the COVID relief you know, measures and the you know the you know the support facilities that are in place, but clearly you know, liquidity facilities predate COVID. You know, we've had mm. you know, TLTRO, we've had TFS, we've had um, you know, FLS before that in the UK. Um, you know, the, the, the ongoing debate has been, you know, how do central banks withdraw, you know, these 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 facilities without without spooking the market? You know, so clearly in the in the US we've got you know the added um, you know the added interest or the added focus on um, you know rate rate markets and you know where where monetary policy goes and how quickly and you know it, it you know this you know sort of central banks sort of seem to be very acutely aware of you know the you know the careful management of that um you know you know so we're not going to get you know fingers crossed we won't get a repeat of the 2013 tape you know taper tantrum in the us and um you know I, I guess all we can do from a certainly from a funding market perspective or from the issuer side is, you know, we, we I guess we want certainty of access, you know, and the variable then is what's the cost of that going forward? You know, we, we, we're in you know, decent a decent situation right now from a spread perspective. But, you know, we would sort of clearly see that, you know, the risks are to you know, spreads moving wider, albeit what the catalyst for that widening is and the magnitude of that widening it's it's really hard to sort of tell at this stage absolutely okay and then um, would anyone else like to jump in on that obviously um you know an interesting um, interesting points there about obviously the central banks having to exit the market at some point in, or you know having to sort of step back to some extent and what what risks that poses is um does anyone would anyone like to yeah change? We mentioned a, a number of risks already, um, and 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 the more important one perhaps is that potential policy mistake going forward by central banks in terms of impact on the credit market. But um, what I wanted to say as well is that in in past periods we've seen long periods of stability for spreads as well, and I personally have seen uh, much tighter levels of spreads for banks than we see now fractions of what we see now. So I wouldn't be surprised as well um, if if we see spreads being stable going forward. This, the risks that we mentioned don't materialize and our base case scenario continues and there is a slow but progressive and a smooth recovery of the economy and spreads could be contained and could be uh, range trading uh, or potentially even going tighter from here. I wouldn't be surprised by that. 
Okay. That, yeah, that's very interesting. And Rosalie, what, what, is that, how does that chime with your view? Do you think that there's room for spreads to go tight from here? Or how are you? Well, I mean, if looking at uh, bank spreads, they are pretty much at pre-pandemic levels um, in, in euro markets. Uh, but but clearly, I mean, I think they can go tighter, uh, but as you know, the, the tighter they go, the, the higher the risks will be. But in terms of, of supply, um, I mean, on the one hand, you've got the, the, the very generous TLTRO, which is which is sucking away some supply, particularly senior preferred. Um, so, I mean, we are expecting net negative uh, supply of senior preferred and negative to, to maybe flat for tier two and 81 capital. The only part of the capital structure where we're expecting positive supply is, is senior non-preferred and that's uh, for MREL purposes. So sort of in general, um, we're not expecting huge increases in, in, in supply um, all in um, and deposit levels um, have grown quite a bit. So, so banks don't need the, the same amount of, um, of funding that, that maybe they, they would have otherwise done uh, with Without, uh, without the sort of the crisis and and the TLTRO. Tyler, the other the other dynamic at play here, of course, is if if you are borrowing from your central bank, as we've heard, um, and in the UK context, that's four year money. Um, it, it obviously puts quite a different slant on your maturity profile. So we wouldn't habitually have gone out and borrowed billions at four years it, it, without the without the existence of the TFSME scheme. And therefore, you tend to see, certainly in our planning, that we, we, you know, we're looking to turn beyond that. So the likelihood of doing slightly cheaper, shorter than four-year money is less. Um, and you know, we did we 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 did a um, a twenty-year euro-covered bond not so long ago, and hugely surprised to the upside, both in terms of um, demand for the name, demand for the UK post Brexit. Um, and that there was demand there for for for, for twenty year money, but I th I do think you will see some issuers' plans kind of trying to term out a bit and pay up in what's a relatively cheap environment for for that maturity extension. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And and how does that? What's your experience been of the market been like in that in that context? Um, uh, Tiger and Asushi. Yeah. So. Like I echo everyone's comment and from issuer's perspective, uh, no complaints. Uh, the funding situation is very attractive for us. So again, no complaint there. And kind of going forward, I expect the market to kind of stable around here because like everyone mentioned, because of strong uh, backdrop uh, from the technical demand and supply. As long as we have those uh, big elephants in the system, Fed, ECB, BOJ, uh, I, I expect the, the market continue to be strong uh, with the caveat that if we see any volatility in a rates market like we have seen in last couple of days. And also as uh, somebody mentioned, if we see any increase of the issues uh, related to MA or daily leveraging from the uh, US tax rate hike, uh, that is kind of another uh, kind of key, key or the things that we uh, monitoring uh, carefully. Absolutely, okay. And, and just uh, just uh, as a sort of a final turn, as we enter the sort of final stages of this discussion, it, I'd be interested to know, because in the last year, we've seen a real in, uh, intensification, you know, I suppose during the pandemic of, of a, fo a focus on on climate and, and, and banks are pledging various things on, on an ESG level. I'd just be really interested to, to get your thoughts on how this is, um, how this has progressed and where we're, where we're at, I suppose, in terms of the, the push um, towards integrating climate objectives and, you know, into banks and, and capital markets, and maybe Alex, I could ask your thoughts on this sort of this sort of area to begin with. Sure. Yeah, so I think so far that's been a push by the regulators, but increasingly it's uh, owned by the industry, and uh, you see a lot of firms being quite proactive about it. Um, uh, you know, just in April, there was this initiative on on becoming net zero as a bank, and uh, you know, a lot of asset managers, including a Japanese pension fund, have have done this. Um, but now we see banks uh, committing to align their entire portfolio to the uh, temperature outcome uh, under the Paris Agreement. So I, I think, in a nutshell, uh, 
there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, the uh, stress tests are being done in the UK this year and Europe next year. Um, the disclosure will be uh, an obligation in, in both jurisdictions. Um, the uh, issuance, I think, will increasingly be done according to the sort of common taxonomy of sustainable activities. Um, so internally, the banks need to gear up. Um, uh, the markets have certainly embraced that topic. And uh, I think uh, the, the investors and, and depositors will increasingly uh, discriminate um, on how well a bank is aligned with the climate agenda. So I think it's a, it's a very significant development that's a real game changer and it will differentiate many credits um, in, in ways that are yet to be better defined. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, that's very interesting. And I mean, Samuel and Rosalie can ask on that sort of that last point. What you know? Do you just discriminate based on how banks are sort of um, moving towards the climate objectives? Is there? I have to um, say that I have to say that these early days, in our in our view, in our opinion, uh, I, I met I personally met a number of banks uh, with their plans and objectives in terms of um, climate change, and I've noticed that the the because it's, it's early days, even the measurement, the measurement tools are not defined very well yet. For example, just to give you an idea how things are developing, it's early for, for banks to pinpoint the actual objectives in terms of the exposure in the balance sheets of lending related to climate change. And um, what they are able to bring to the table these days, in my experience, is that whatever they are exposed to either as intermediaries or parts of a syndicated loan, but not necessarily what exact amount they have in the balance sheet or what exact amount they are planning to have in the balance sheet in five years' time, in 10 years' time. So that's still a, a, new, a new path, I, I believe. So it's early days for us to be judgmental, and, and I think there will be uh, evolution here and, and banks will become better, but definitely it's a trend that we'll have to consider uh, with more carefully in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I would certainly agree with uh, with Samuel there. The, um, you know, it, it is early days. Um, I think um, bank fundamentals will begin to be clearly affected uh, three to five years from now. Um, I mean, we are speaking to, to all our issuers on their plans. Um, but um, I think disclosure needs to improve um, quite a bit. And we're seeing uh, quite a bit of um, uh, diversification uh, differences between sort of different geographies within Europe in terms of, of how far along uh, they've got. Um, but one of the difficulties I think that banks have, it's, it's not like with corporates where they just, um, where they primarily look at their own carbon footprint, it's understanding their, their customers, their clients uh, carbon footprint. Um, and whilst maybe some of the larger corporates, um, the larger clients that um, banks have are, uh, that are, are more able to provide this information as you get down to, to SMEs, it is harder to, to get this information. So it's a process and I think we're sort of, we're, we're at the beginning, but um, certainly we are looking at it quite closely and we are beginning to incorporate it into, into how we, we fundamentally rank the banks. Absolutely. Um it would be interesting to get the issue with experience here then um you know your plans changing and what are you hearing from your yeah. your investors so uh, I, I think in a, in a, in a, clearly the the, the 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 interest of investors in this has been exponential over the last year and then and the focus has ramped up massively but we all know that as has um as Rosalie said the, the the level of disclosure um we didn't sign up to the 2050 thing because we think it's it, it you, you're effectively signing up to something you can't control right now and we think some of the targets and, and midway points that people have put out are unrealistic um, what we are trying to do is influence much more governmental intervention and policy intervention here because quite very simply put um greening the uk housing stock is a very huge ask mainly because of the well, there's two elements to it. There's the cost to the consumer, which is just not affordable. There's the fact that the kit, 
and I speak from bitter experience, it's quite it takes up a lot of room. So if you're air sourcing the, an average home, you've got to find some space to to, to put all of the, the apparel in, which is not easy. Um, but most importantly, if you've got a, 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 an obligation to try and put people in their homes, you can't say, well, that place is not energy efficient, so we're not going to let you buy it. So I think there's a real balancing act, but I think there's one that needs top-down support for, for, for policy to make sure that we've got the resources, financial, uh, and the resources just in terms of number of skilled tradesmen to fit this stuff to, to make it work. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a long haul. Mm. Yeah, we also announced uh, in our most recent announcement, we uh, announced our plan to reduce our uh, CO2 emission on uh, SMBC base, so scope one and two. And also we added, uh, uh, we tried to assess scope three uh, CO2 emission during this uh, current midterm management plan and disclose uh, kind of mid to long term uh, goals by 2023. And also the government, uh, as you probably know, the prime minister uh, announced his uh, plan to reduce CO2 emission by 46% by 2030. So those are also the kind of, you know, uh, helping for us to accelerate our ESG strategy in Japan. Yeah. I, I completely agree with um, what uh, Rob said on, on the government policies being crucial. Um, I think uh, the banks are a lens on the wider economy. Uh, they will be in the spotlight, uh, but they cannot take sole responsibility for engineering this this transition. Yeah. yeah. And Peter, would you like to add anything? Finally, we've we've not got very long left, unfortunately. Um, not not a lot to add. Uh, you know, it's sort of clearly, a, you know, it's going to be a sort of it has been a key fo you know key focus for the group for you know for four or five years, it's going to continue to be, you know, a, a, a key focus for the group and, um, you know, for, for the, you know, the rest of the, you know, issuer community within the UK, but not nothing really to add beyond what's, what's been said. Okay. Um, well, if, if um, I, I'd, I'd just like to um, uh, ask a, a quick question from the audience then if, if there's time, but who, I mean, somebody has asked, should central banks consider green tier or rose? I suppose, it, would anyone like to pick that up? Uh, yes or not? Um, well. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a possibility of a, of a connection between central bank support somehow being linked with greening your lending stock in some way, shape or form. It's, it's, it's perhaps an obvious development. I've heard it mentioned, probably not by anyone with any um, real internal knowledge of it, but I think that's a distinct possibility and probably makes an awful lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah. We've certainly discussed that as a, as a possibility, not on based on any anything we've heard, but just as a as an idea. Uh, certainly, um, from issues um, that we've spoken to, it's, it is difficult for them to make their lending cheaper for for green projects. But obviously, something tangible like this would be very helpful. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, and and thank you to to all the panelists. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I wish we'd had, had a lot. A lot longer um, and thanks thanks also to the audience for tuning in and, and, and for your question um, I'd just like to say that uh, taking place after this panel we have a keynote interview with Laurie Heinel who's the Glo global chief investment officer at State Street so if you'd like to to stick around you can stay tuned for that um, and thanks again thank you very much <laughs>